Hi everyone, and uh, I hope you've been enjoying philosophy during the commencement period without me. Um, uh, I hope you enjoy your last double period as well. Um, today I'm going to be going through a reading. This is um, not necessarily written in response to Descartes, but we're looking at it as uh, a comparison or an alternative viewpoint from the one that Descartes put forward, which is, remember, this is the idea of Cartesian dualism. Um, so the idea that we exist as a mind and a body, and that they are two very different things. The body is a physical entity, whereas the mind is a non-physical thing. And remember, Descartes, ma Descartes makes this argument in several ways, um, but you know, one of the things he talks about is the fact that, well, the mind doesn't have any uh, physical um, properties to it. You know, it doesn't have a shape or a size or a colour. Uh, whereas all physical things do. And so he comes to the conclusion that therefore it must be something else. Um, we're going to be looking at a very, very, very brief section of um, a reading by David Armstrong uh, in an essay that he wrote called The Nature of Mind. Um, now this is towards the end of this reading, so we're sort of missing all of the build-up and all of the explanation of some of the points. Um, but he's essentially going to be putting forward the idea that, no, the mind is not a separate thing from the body. Um, David Armstrong is going to be making the argument that uh, the mind is essentially just another sense. If we can think of it as like a sixth sense, um, we don't think of that there's any magic going on when we see something or we hear something uh, or we smell something or taste something or touch something. David Armstrong says, when you think... Um, so when you're conscious of something, when you're uh, you know, going back to qualia, which hopefully you've talked a little bit about in class, um, you know, when you picture something in your mind, uh, like a rose, that's not like some magical, mystical, non-physical thing. Um, it is essentially just like seeing. Uh, it's an internal sense. And so David Armstrong's going to be putting forward the argument that actually our mind, what we should be thinking of our mind as, it is uh, like a sixth sense and it's an internal sense. It allows us to be aware of what we are thinking and what we are feeling at any given time. Um, at one point he refers to it as a self-scanning mechanism of the central nervous system. So it's essentially our brain letting us know what our brain is doing or being aware of what our brain is doing. Okay, so on your reading, um, you can see uh, we're starting down the bottom on the left-hand side where it says, in general, we can think of perceptions as. Um, so take out your reading, take out a pen, take out a highlighter. Um, remember, this is sort of in comparison to what Descartes has written. So keep Descartes' ideas in your head, but this is the materialist argument that we only exist as a physical body. Uh, there is no non-physical mind. Okay, so here we go. In general, we can think of perceptions as inner states or events apt for producing, uh, for the production, sorry, of certain sorts of selective behaviour towards our environment. So earlier on in the reading, Armstrong pointed out that uh, really our mind is just that scanning mechanism of the central nervous system. It integrates everything that we're getting from the other senses, and then it allows us to perform actions. So if you think of, say, you know, someone throwing a ball to you, Okay, your senses are telling you that the ball is moving through the air towards you, but it's your mind that actually knits all of that together, and it's your mind that says, well, there are several things that we can do here. We can move out of the way so that the ball doesn't hit us. We can move our hands so that we intercept the ball and catch it. Uh, we can um, move our hands so that we knock the ball out of the way in midair. Um, and so that's what he means by apt for producing certain sorts of selective behavior. Um, towards our environment. Our mind is what integrates the messages that have come in via our other senses and then uh, it essentially gives us all of these different actions that we can perform. To perceive is like acquiring a key to a door. You do not have to use the key. You can put it in your pocket and never bother um, about the door. But if you do want to open the door, the key may be essential. The blind man is a man who does not acquire certain keys and, as a result, is not able to operate in his environment in the way that somebody who has his sight can operate. Um, so, again, Armstrong drawing the parallel here between thinking uh, and, um, 
our other senses, um, you know, the in this case, the sense of sight or perception. Um, uh, it seems then a very promising view to take of perceptions that they are inner states defined by the sorts of selective behavior that they enable the perceiver to exhibit. If so impelled, so that's just a fancy way of saying if the person wants to. Uh, now, how is this discussion of perception related to the question of consciousness or experience? The sort of thing that the driver who is in a state of automatism has not got, but which we normally do have. So this is relating to something that Armstrong talked about earlier in the reading, and it might seem a little bit odd, um, particularly because I'm assuming that uh, everyone in the room um, hasn't driven enough to have experienced this themselves, but trust me, you will one day. It gets to a point where the act of driving becomes so second nature that quite often what can happen is you can drive uh, a great distance and not actually really be aware of your driving, um, that's not to say that you like drift off and fall asleep or you're not paying attention. Um, you know, you stop when the light is red and you, you know, apply the brake to avoid crashing into the person in front of you and you accelerate when you need to, you turn corners. You're responding to your environment. But in terms of what your mind was doing, it was elsewhere. You were thinking about something else. I'm sure that we've all experienced this at some point. Um, where we're doing something, but we're actually thinking of something else. Think of something that's really second nature to you, like sweeping the floor at the end of a day of work, okay? You're not like, while you're doing that, you're not, okay, now I have to lift the broom and I'm going to push it forward and that's going to push all the dirt forward. No, you're in autopilot, your body is sweeping the floor, you get everything, but in your head you're thinking, oh, I really want to do this when I get home, or blah, 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 Okay. So this is what Armstrong's talking about with automatism. And basically what he's saying is this is evidence that your this self-scanning mechanism of the central nervous system, what we what Descartes called the mind, can actually be thinking about something else. It's not always responding to the external environment. Essentially, sometimes you can be daydreaming. Some of you might be doing it right now. Um, but uh, continuing on, simply this. My proposal is that consciousness in this sense of the word, is nothing but perception or awareness of the state of our own mind. The driver in a state of automatism perceives or is aware of the road. If he did not, the car would be in a ditch, but he is not currently aware of his awareness of the road. He perceives the road, but he does not perceive his perceiving or anything else that is going on in the mind. He is not, as we normally are, conscious of what is going on in his mind. So what Armstrong is talking about here is essentially when you drift off and you daydream, particularly when you're doing a mundane task, um, your what we might say is that your mind kind of splits in two. The part that you're not aware of continues to perform the task. So it's kind of like working in the background. Okay, yeah, I'm going to keep the car on the road. No, oh, red light, let's apply the brake. And uh, okay, let's swerve to avoid that hazard, that kind of thing. That's all going on in the background, though. So you're not actually consciously aware of that. You're not perceiving that happening. Perception is still happening. Otherwise, as Armstrong said, you'd end up in a ditch. But you're not aware that that's happening. Instead, you're thinking about what you want to have for dinner. Okay, Your mind is elsewhere. Um, again, hopefully, we've all experienced this. Think of doing something that you're really, really, really used to doing. Um, and so I conceive of consciousness or experience in this sense of the uh, of the words in the way that Locke and Kant conceived it as like perception. Kant, in a striking phrase, spoke of inner sense. We cannot directly observe the minds of others, but each of us has the power to observe directly our own minds and perceive what is going on there. The driver in the automatic state is one whose inner eye is shut who is not currently aware of what is going on in his own mind. So, you know, these references to Locke and Kant, these are two um, other philosophers. We'll be talking a little bit about both of them later in the year, um, in second semester. But uh, they both put forward this idea that there's no magical element to the mind. It is just an inner sense. It's inner perception. Um, now, if this account is along the right lines, why should we not give an account of the inner observation along the same lines as we have already given of perception? Why should we not conceive of it as an inner state, a state in this case directed towards other inner states, 
and not to the environment which enables us if we are so impelled to behave in a selective way towards our own states of mind one who is aware or conscious of his thoughts or his emotions is one who has the capacity to make discriminations between his different mental states his capacity might be exhibited in words he might say that he is in an angry state of mind when and only when he was in an angry state of mind but such verbal behavior would be the mere expression or result of the awareness the awareness itself would be an inner state the sort of inner state that gave the man a capacity for such behavioral expressions so a little bit confusing here but essentially think of i want you to become aware of whatever you're thinking about right now let's say become aware of your emotional state now it's the last day of commencement it's the last double period of commencement i'm guessing that most people are feeling maybe an element of excitement about the uh, holidays coming up um you know for those of you who have really gotten into philosophy you might be feeling a sense of dread that you don't have any more philosophy classes for a while but um essentially what armstrong is saying here is that you have this sixth sense if you're able to do that if you can go okay what am i feeling right now happiness okay you that's like exactly like me saying okay what are you seeing right now and it might be you know this slide right in front of you um, or the page that you're reading from okay now armstrong sort of saying why do we need to add an element of kind of magic here do we really need to add a non-physical mind to be able to explain this isn't it enough to say well in the same way that we don't pretend that it's magic when we see things this is just our brain doing what our brain is there to do why can't we say that us thinking or us being aware of our thoughts is just our brain doing what it's there to do a sixth sense why do we have to put some sort of non-physical magical element into it it's over complicating it from armstrong's perspective um, so i have argued that consciousness of our own mental state may be assimilated to perception of our own mental state and that like other perceptions it may then be conceived of as an inner state or event giving a capacity for selective behavior in this case uh, selective behavior towards our own mental state all this is meant to be simply a logical analysis of conclu uh, of consciousness and none of it entails although it does not rule out a purely physicalist account of what these inner states are um, but if we are convinced on general scientific grounds that a purely physical account of man is likely to be the true one then there seems to be no bar to our identifying these inner states with purely physical states uh, of the central nervous system and so consciousness of our own mental state becomes simply the scanning of one part of our central nervous system by another consciousness is a self-scanning mechanism of the central nervous system so this is the quote that i said earlier um, what descartes has said here is that this argument doesn't prove materialism or as he's put it physicalism uh, or the physicalist argument they're both the same thing um, so he's not actually putting an argument that uh, materialism is correct what he's saying is what i've shown you is that we can explain how we think and feel and perceive our mind without needing to add some sort of magical element so why overcomplicate it if i can explain it just through our physical self then why do i need to add a non-physical self okay um, and as he said uh, you know uh, it's kind of like think of it as like virus software on a computer the virus software is there to scan the computer hard drive to see if there's any threats there your consciousness is kind of like scanning your mind to tell you what you are thinking about to tell you what you're focusing on okay um, a self-scanning mechanism of our central nervous system uh, all right last part as i have emphasized before i've done no more than sketch a program for a philosophy of mind there are all sorts of ex uh, expansions and eludications to be made but and all sorts of doubts and difficulties to be stated and overcome but i hope i have done enough to show that a purely physicalist theory of the mind is an exciting and plausible intellectual option really descartes just summing ah descartes sorry armstrong's just summing up here saying i haven't proven anything there's still lots of things to talk about but i think we can say that the mind is just purely physical 
All right. I hope that clarified the reading for you and good luck with your essay over the holidays. I'll see you in term one.